And welcome back, folks, to Truth versus News here. And Truth versus Official Facts. This is October the 6th. Now we're uh, our second hour, something like uh, yeah, eight. We got 28 days to the election. It comes back out of, out of the old Walter Reed back home now at the White House and all kinds of fun is happening. And so, Jim, uh, take, take it away. Thank you, Don. Trump announces leaving Walter Reed, don't be afraid of COVID. Pretty significant. I'll be leaving the great Walter Reed Medical Center today at 6.30, feeling really good. Don't be afraid of COVID. Don't let it dominate your life. We have developed under the Trump administration some really great drugs and knowledge. I feel better than I did 20 years ago. And of course, he made a successful flight back and returned to the White House. Meanwhile, Michigan attorney says, burn your masks and forget COVID emergency orders after state Supreme Court decision. Southfield, Michigan, Friday afternoon is most where logging off for the weekend, the Michigan Supreme Court issued a ruling that many of Governor Gretchen Whitmer's emergency orders regarding COVID-19 are not legal. The stunning ruling said she illegally drew authority from a 1945 law that does not apply. One aspect the court pointed out was the redeclaring of states of emergency. It would have been a string of orders from Whitmer only meant to last 28 days. The governor does not possess the authority to exercise emergency powers under the Emergency Powers of the Governor Act of 1945 because that act is an unlawful delegation of legislative power to the executive in violation of the Michigan Constitution. Accordingly, the executive orders issued by the governor in response to the COVID-19 pandemic now lack any basis under Michigan law. Attorney Catherine Henry has argued against the governor's orders in court for the past six months, saying Whitmer had no grounds to continue extending her state of emergency every 28 days. The ruling means the Republican-controlled Michigan House and Senate will now have a say in relation to COVID-19 orders. Henry said the governor and her office took liberties uh, with the state law too far when she continued to extend the order. Henry said that while the governor insists she's got a couple of weeks, it's not true. She said it means we can ignore all mask mandates, social distancing, and more effective on Friday at 4.35 p.m. Scott, your thoughts. I think this is a great case. It's taken a long time to get there. We knew from the very beginning this was the inevitable end of unconstitutional dictatorship and, and authoritarian unconstitutional exercises of powers by Whitmer, by uh, Gavin Newsom, by uh, the, the various Democrat governors. All of their COVID-19 lockdowns have been ruled unconstitutional. This is the starting point in the Michigan Supreme Court. This needs to be applied by all states and it needs to be taken to the Supreme Court as well because it is a violation of your natural rights to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. You're judged sick without due process. You're, you're uh, suspended in your rights to religiously worship and gather and assemble. Uh, it's showing prejudice between the right to assemble in a church, synagogue, mosque, or other religious uh, organization or gathering versus the right to assemble and protest by Black Lives Matter, Antifa, or other retard hooligans that go around throwing Molotov cocktails at buildings and shooting cops. So all of this COVID-19 lockdown acts of tyranny need to be overthrown. And the moment the court rules it's overthrown is the moment that the, uh, the, the uh, unconstitutional powers disappear, evaporate like, like smoke in the wind. It doesn't take 21 days. It never had the power of law in the beginning. Right. So all of this is coming uh, to fruit and uh, it needs to be replicated all over the country by other states. Again, DeSantis needs to stand up and take lead. He did it in Florida. He should call out every governor to do the same thing and it'll, it'll have enormous positive political implications for him, Jim. Stunning how eager the Democrat governors and mayors have been to violate the constitution of their own states. It's outrageous. David, your thoughts? Well, you know, I think um, I, I've just had an opportunity to take a peek at the uh, decision and what I like about it is it, it discusses the ability of applicants to bypass the Court of Appeals and go, go directly to the uh, Supreme Court 
because it's the Supreme Court of uh, the state of Michigan that has the opportunity to uh, review it on, when it's such a critical issue. Um, so, you know, it's the, you know, in a weird way, it it's it's indicative of what happens in our society. To get to the appellate court, you have to form a prayer, and then that prayer will take you, uh, if it if it can, all the way to the Supreme Court. So there's this avenue. As long as you have a meritorious petition, you can get in for immediate review, and that's what happened here. The issue was of such uh, significance and the consequences uh, so significant that it went right up to the Supreme Court and they issued their decision. I, I think it's admirable. It, it shows that the uh, judicial process uh, absolutely works. I'm surprised that the, uh, I haven't read all this yet, but I'm surprised that the uh, Democratic governor did not appeal it to the United States Supreme Court there must be a little bit of chicken little in that. Um, so, uh, you know, to have, have these issues uh, uh, even looked at in the Supreme Court under an alternative theory, you know, and then them just backing out, tucking tail and running home, you know, this, this dog is in flight. This, this uh, serpent is headed out of town. And uh, I think it's a great ruling. It says a lot for two is. things. It says a lot for our judicial system, and it says a lot for how... how it says a lot about how truth in the judicial system is respected. And, and, and look how the timing is just incredible. Meanwhile, by the way, on the opposite side, a journalist set out looking for white supremacists outside Walter Reed, and this is the only one she found. She said, <laughs> sir, are you a white supremacist? And this black guy real cheerfully said, yes, of course, I'm a white supremacist. But what I like is the timing of this, David. I mean, the whole American people are going to be outraged to discover that their rights were violated by these rulings, and it was the Democrat governors who are doing it. And by God, they're going to pay a price at the polls. I think this could be sensational. Scott. This opened the door for 42 USC 1983-85, suing them civilly for violating your constitutional rights. Under well, color I, I, yes. I think it does. I think, uh, you know, you've got, uh, you have an, an abridgment of constitutional rights. You have a determination by the Supreme Court of, of Michigan. Uh, it certainly, you know, you have personal liability when, when you step out and you violate, when you're a public official and you violate private rights, and if you do so with any kind of intent of fraud or abuse or uh, waste, uh, you know, you can get yourself in a position of personal liability. So, you know, I would encourage, uh, I would encourage the floodgates to open in Michigan. I I'd like to see a lot of lawsuits. I think this is the beginning of the end, and the Democrats are going to pay a huge price for this. Huge. Right. Meanwhile, these debate moments may haunt Joe Biden for the rest of the campaign. One concerns the Green New Deal. He was asked directly about it, claimed he does not support it. This would be news to Joe Biden and whoever wrote his website back in June. He said, Biden says a Green New Deal, which has become a litmus test for Democrats, is a critical framework when it comes to combating climate challenges in this country. Not only did he support it, it was a defining issue for him. Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, whose office first proposed a Green New Deal, offered a muted reaction to the debate night rejection. But this will leave a mark on the left and those who are skeptical of Biden's ability to fend them off if he's elected president. Biden was also incoherent on the basics of his own leadership during the debate. Moderate Chris, moderator Chris Wallace asked Biden one very good question, whether he's ever called up a single Democrat governor or mayor and asked him to deal with the ongoing violent and deadly riots in Democrat-run cities. He wimped out. He said, I don't hold public office now. I'm a former vice president. I made it clear in my public statements that the violence should be prosecuted. But he also declared himself to be the Democratic Party during the debate. Biden has still to this day not denounced Antifa, organizing and instigating the riots. During the debate, he clung to the outdated notion 
that the left-wing terrorist group is an idea, not an organization. Well, that's completely absurd. Right, even observed the FBI has seen Antifa or engaged in organized tactical activity at the local and regional level. Its adherents have coalesced and worked together in nodes rather than a structured hierarchy across the country. The type of organization is not diminished how seriously the FBI considers the threat. Ray, the head of the department, we don't view how nationally organized something is as a proxy for how dangerous it is. The victims of violence in Democrat-run cities certainly see the violence Antifa instigates and are breaking for Trump. Biden's refusal to address him, his failure to lead won't go unnoticed except by him. Scott, your thoughts. I think uh, this is being played exactly the right way by the president. He could be hitting a few more balls out of the uh, uh, ballpark, of course, by taking photographs of himself, giving blood for plasma treatment generation. That's known. That's very positive. The American people would, would signify that as he's giving his blood to help and cure America. His, uh, his uh, return to the White House uh, on Monday was uh, powerful. I think uh, he, he has the grounds. And I asked a doctor yesterday if he has the grounds to write an executive order guaranteeing that every American be uh, given access to uh, the therapeutics and drugs that he got access to, uh, hydroxychloroquine being one of the top ones. And that needs to be publicized. And, and if he's been taking it, uh, he needs to publicize it. This, this needs to be seen as his redemption coming out of the cave, out of the darkness, out of the sickness, and fighting it off. And he said that effectively. He said, don't let it dominate you. Don't be in fear. Uh, and that's a very encouraging uh, message. And uh, 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 him taking off the mask and him uh, behaving cavalier. I love that when the Democrat said he's behaving cavalier. That's exactly what he's supposed to be doing. He's supposed to be seen riding a white horse with a battle axe, slaying these pervert Democrats and their lies and witchcraft behind COVID-19 and the, and, the, and the fear that they're trying to hypnotize the country with. And, and Cuomo, this bastard in New York, should be uh, shut down and arrested immediately. His the same, again, all of these rulings of exercising unconstitutional power needs to be brought like a battering ram into these little uh, castles of these elitist, arrogant Democrats, and they need to be completely hauled out by their hair, uh, and all of their unconstitutional powers uh, shut down. And uh, I think Donald Trump uh, uh, appearing uh, out of this is a very, very positive thing that will only have more uh, benefits of politically, Jim. I think Trump should start hammering, hammering, hammering the Michigan decision and saying now this applies across the entire nation. David, your thoughts? Well, I, 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 um, I concur uh, to a certain degree across the board. How, however, I think this can be uh, accomplished civilly. Um, I think that uh, there are two important factors. It is number one, that the Michigan Supreme Court has issued a decision. It has factual findings. It has legal effect. Number two, it's uh, demonstrable in terms of finding that there is some element of uh, political party bias or prejudice in the presentation of the, the I think, COVID-19 pandemic. Um, so it, it can have remarkable consequences. And I would hope that, uh, that it ignites enough public opinion. Uh, you know, we've had We've had plenty of ignition out here in California with our fires going up. You know, we've had plenty of ignition as to burn, baby, burn, you know, taking place everywhere. Uh, you know, so this, this decision and President Trump's reliance on it, I agree with, with Scott entirely. He should, he should wave this flag around the town. So it will calm the waters, calm the disturbances. Let's run away from this fear and loathing about this dreaded COVID when we know it's a farce. A number of commentators have observed this may be his most presidential moment by seeking to reassure the public about this great menace that's been so Pence, massively Pence exaggerated needs, by the press. Pence Here's a dandy. This, Jim. Pence needs to mention this at the debate tomorrow. Very important that Pence cites this case tomorrow at the debate. Scott, I have no doubt he will do that. You're right. We also right. have Don't cases in Pennsylvania and Washington State that are similar to Michigan. 
So we're, we're gaining some momentum here, but our press up here is not recognizing it for Washington. Uh, so uh, you're, you're saying there have already been similar decisions in Pennsylvania oh, yes. and Washington? Yes. Yeah, no. that'll be a big deal tomorrow night at the debate. Scott's exactly right about that. Should be a, a central issue. Here's a doozy. Yeah. Former Twitter CEO calls for political enemies to be lined up against the wall and shot. That's the way. Former Twitter CEO Don Costolo has publicly called for people who disagree with him to be lined up against the wall and shot. But there's no big tech bias on it. <laughs> Me first capitalists who think you can separate society from business are going to be the first people lined up against the wall and shot in the revolution. I'll happily provide video commentary, he tweeted. This is completely outrageous. Costello was in violation of Twitter's own rules regarding the glorification of violence. But of course, Twitter isn't going to take it down. Meanwhile, the California governor, Newsom, opens the door for reparations as the state continues to be on fire. This is the idea of, of, of modern day uh, uh, taxpayers being required who never were slave owners being required to give other citizens who never were slaves, uh, uh, you know, money as compensation for their past. This is completely disgusting. California just became the first state in the nation to mandate the study and development of proposals for reparation. Our past is one of slavery, racism, and injustice. Our systems were built to oppress people of color. It's time we acknowledge that. Well, how can we acknowledge it when it isn't true? I mean, this is just simply absurd. Very, very, very stunning. Democrat Congresswoman Barbara Lee on the need for reparations. Our country was built on systems of racism, violence, and oppression. It won't change unless we take bold action to dismantle systemic racism, examine the need for reparations. But what is the evidence for systemic racism? Chicago Black Lives Matter organizer Ariel Atkins framed the reparations debate this way. The whole idea of criminality is based on racism anyway, she told. NPR, because criminality is publishing people for things they have needed to do to survive, or just the way society has attracted them with a white supremacist BS. Embarrassing. <laughs> this is so shabby. Scott, your thoughts? Well, it's, it's uh, I think, unconstitutional. I think it would facilitate uh, increased violence and aggression against uh, government, and uh, it could spark a serious civil war. And uh, uh, areas of California seceding from this uh, sort of action. And it certainly puts black people in a very negative light. And uh, I, I think it would alienate and cause blacks to be just uh, head shakingly scorned and reviled as parasites uh, that have to exist off of stealing the money out of people's wallets because of uh, things that happened uh, 200 years ago that in fact did not happen in California. California was a free state, so there was no racism or slavery that uh, had any part in California law, and you cannot uh, use law to uh, punish for private matters, uh, and, and uh, private matters of slavery in other states are not the business of California, and uh, this whole, the whole thing is absolutely sickening. And it's another uh, sign of Gavin Newsom needing to be immediately pulled out. Jim? Scott, those, those points are simply excellent. I'm betting David will agree. Your thoughts? Well, I think if anything, uh, you know, Gavin Newsom, and Newsom, in my opinion, is inviting a recall. Um, you know, his, uh, uh, his recent uh, proclamations have turned into dictatorial statements that, in my opinion, are designed to oppress uh, business and, and people and families and, and everything in the state of California. You know, the, the, the struggle for equalization, the uh, distribution of wealth, the um, equality with respect to rights, liberties, privileges, that's guaranteed by our Constitution. It's an ongoing struggle. It's not something that is accomplished overnight. My family, you know, my family is out of the Welsh mines, okay? Miners, 
all right, in, in, uh, in Wales. And, you know, we're, we're out of the mines. You know, I'm, I'm probably one of the, the few members of our family who had, you know, who enjoyed a college education and, and had an ability to go to professional school. And, you know, since I've been out of school and practicing law and in school, I've seen every effort being made by colleges and institutions to, to encourage more uh, black, black students, more Latino students, more Filipino students, more Asian students, and everybody's competing with one another. That's a wonderful, wonderful experience. Um, so it's, you know, it's just this, this negative view of society, like there's some social agenda, which is a, in my opinion, a socialist agenda to yep. try and equalize uh, the products of labor, the distribution of wealth, all those things. And I don't think they benefit mankind at all. I think they result in the, uh, uh, you know, the duplication of automatons, people who are incapable of thinking on their own. That's a recipe for mediocrity, no question about it. And I think that the prospect of recalling Newsom is terrific. Meanwhile, yep. CNN says we're never getting back to normal. In a piece entitled, There's No Getting Back to Normal, the sooner we accept that, the better. CNN International Security Editor Nick Patton Walsh writes, things are most likely never going back to normal. CNN also previously published an article arguing wearing face masks is going to become as taboo as drunk driving, uh, uh, leaving innumerable experts across the world having warned that face masks are largely pointless from the perspective of preventing the spread of coronavirus. It may mean he thinks that wearing face masks is going to become permanent. Now we're being yeah. told this is the new normal. We're being told that coronavirus hysteria will never end. Walsh says a pre-corona world is now mere nostalgia. The public needs to come to terms with it. What a disgusting creep. And if you want a candidate to line up against the wall, this is it. Meanwhile, the New York Times admits the World Health Organization decision not to close borders at the standard start of the pandemic was based on politics, not science. The WHO has long encouraged mass tourism and said closing borders wouldn't stop the spread of COVID-19. A New York Times investigation found the policy was never based on science, but instead on politics and economics. How awful is that? Meanwhile, Sweden is staying open for business during the virus pandemic. Sweden has returned to normal. It seemed very last January before the spread of COVID-19 in Europe, but it was actually last week as many European nations were tightening restrictions among a surge of new coronavirus cases in Sweden, new infections, if tipping upward slightly, still remain surprisingly low. I have potentially hundreds of tiny interactions when working here, said Tom Feeney, a Briton who manages the co-working space. Our work lives should not be reduced to just a screen in front of us. Ultimately, we are social animals they are surviving and thriving and back to normal. Scott, your thoughts? Well, everything turned back to normal on Friday, essentially, with the Govern Governor Whitmer's uh, orders being overthrown and ruled uh, unconstitutional by the Michigan Supreme Court. And Michigan's constitution uh, is the template for California's constitution. California borrowed the Michigan constitution and made it their own, essentially. So if, uh, if that court ruling uh, you know, applies, it can certainly be passed over to the California Constitution. These executive orders and these COVID-19 lockdown orders have no power of law. They have no power to influence behavior. They have no demand capability. Individuals can immediately take off their masks and not have any uh, uh, damage being uh, incurred against them. And if a company or a business discriminates against them, for refusing to wear a mask, that company can be sued for discrimination. Uh, so there, you know, all of this is in the on the side of people who want to return to a state of normalcy, happiness, prosperity, freedom, liberty, the right to to uh, be free to associate and move and and uh, worship and uh, speak without the harassment and the fascist dictatorship totalitarianism 
that we see in Australia and Victoria, for example, right. where they're arresting pregnant women who are going to the beaches or arresting other pregnant women who put up COVID-19 uh, protest uh, messages on Facebook. The, the gall of Australia to uh, engage in that is such a disgusting hypocrisy that it needs to be called out and the president should call them out and say, you can't do this to your people. And you, you have the gall and the arrogance to walk around the world and claim Iran and Russia and other countries are human rights violations. <laughs> you are the epitome of human rights violations, Victoria. And I'm surprised that you don't have a mass assassination of the police that are engaged in these fascist, br brutal abuses of the citizenry. But maybe that day is coming, Jim. Absolutely right. Oh. David, your thoughts. Well, you know, as, <clears throat> as I've always said, I'm an advocate for the civil resolution of matters. Um, you know, but that, that you got to worry when a guy at Twitter posts about, uh, you know, lining up capitalists and having them shot. You know, he's talking about his own revolution. You know, that, that scares me to a certain extent. It concerns me to another. Um, so I just think we're going to see a progress as we get closer to this election. I just think we're going to see more and more uh, uh, manifestations of, of hostility. And uh, I'm very concerned about that. I think it's, I think we should calmly, rationally, discreetly, safely encourage the removal of masks from people in America. It worked in Sweden, it'll work here. Yeah, sure, you betcha. That's Absolutely true. correct. It worked in Sweden, it'll work here. And how shocking that we should discover how many tyrants we have in high office. Brit Hume had a thread today, campus 9-11 COVID-19 update. Despite over 70,000 tests at 50 major universities, barely any reported hospitalizations, three and no deaths. Meanwhile, a lot of protests. Brit, for the millionth time, it's not the kids we're worried about, it's the ones they spread it to. Another, the issue is the students, it's the fear of the professors, many are way past their expiration dates. Another, <laughs> sometimes you say astoundingly dumb things. No one ever claimed masks or fail-safe system for preventing COVID. They're a wise and easy preventative method, but not foolproof. Being stuck in a hermetically sealed car with a COVID patient is never safe, even with a mask. Meanwhile, there are now more recorded deaths of COVID cases of COVID-19 in the White House than in New Zealand, Taiwan, and Vietnam combined. And they have 124 million people. WTF Banana Republic, meaning USA. Meanwhile, yeah. how is it it took all these months for the CDC to come to the conclusion the virus is aerosolized? Meanwhile, good threat. This matches up with CDC survival rates. It's almost as if college kids are not at risk. Here's a quick summary. Survival rates, age 0 to 19, 99.997%. 20 to 49, 99.98%. 50 to 69, 99.5%. Age 70 and over, 94.6%. It's actually that college kids aren't at risk. Meanwhile, Victoria police were handcuffing a pregnant birch goer. State authorities consider extending lockdown rules. Scott was talking about this completely stunning footage of the dramatic arrest circulated online showing a handful of armed police officers towering over a woman described as pregnant by local media in the Altona Beach in the Melbourne area. An officer is seen trying to put a mask on the detainee as his colleagues handcuff her and repeatedly tell other speechgoers to stand back. People lining the incident could be heard shouting, what did she do? Why are you arresting her? As tensions grew, onlookers swarmed the police squad yelling insults at them. Still, the public uproar didn't stop law enforcers from walking the woman off the sand. Victoria police claimed she was found to be more than five kilometers away from her home refused to provide identification and was allegedly aggressive toward them. The incident came on the back of warnings by Victoria state authorities that police could seal off beaches around Melbourne if residents neglect social distancing. 
Victoria police have powers. They have a steely determination to make sure people are following the rules. State Premier Daniel Andrews warned, full-blown fascism, pregnant Aussie woman handcuffed and charged with inciting anti-lockdown event on Facebook. Just disgusting. Scott, your thoughts. I am truly amazed that you haven't had more of these police killed, run over, hacked into pieces, shot, whatever the weapon. Uh, this is amazing to me that they can be allowed to get away with these sort of brutal fascistic actions in a country that claims to be a paragon of virtue and a beacon of human rights around the world when they are the opposite. And this sort of thing, I can tell you, I, 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 I think uh, Americans wouldn't stand for it. I, I, I pr can only uh, say it's because of the confiscation of the citizens' weapons and, and the guns that has allowed these, uh, the fascist uh, dictators to, to do this. But I think it's, it's absolutely uh, mesmerizing that this has been, been, been allowed. You know, and I, I want to say one thing too. I've, I've had, you know, remember when I went to Iran as part of the New Horizons conference and I had many American uh, CIA military guys who went over with us as well, State Department people. Uh, and it, it, it's truly brutal what uh, this COVID-19 lockdown does to that country in particular because, uh, I've, you know, I've gotten messages uh, telling me uh, we've been without, this is from uh, one of the people who ran the conference. She said, we've been without our essential medication for the past seven months because America has sanctioned us from getting two specific meds into the country. Uh, Nader should have had his pacemaker changed two months ago, but because of the sanctions, we can't get the right one. Nader's health is at stake every minute of the day. I live in fear that I might lose him because of the sanctions imposed by the U.S., signed by an executive order by Mr. Trump. Uh, and, uh, you know, it, it, I, I had originally asked, you know, uh, Press TV and, and uh, you know, the, the Iranians uh, to pray for the president because it demonstrates a superior, magnificent character and it uh, could facilitate, you know, a, a healing. But her point was uh, very, very powerful. And she said, uh, uh, the people in Iran can't forgive him after all uh, because of the assassination of General Soleimani and the destructive sanctions on the country. Uh, she says, I have not seen any news outlet that commented negatively on the president's sickness here in Iran. The Iranians are not mean people, but they have been hurt very deeply by the unjust foreign policies of the U.S. Uh, what you are suggesting is very idealistic and is a reflection of your soul, but people are in so, so much pain here. Uh, and, uh, you know, it, it's, it's very true and it, it warrants uh, exposure that these sanctions on Iran and the COVID-19 and the shutting down of medications and, the, and the, uh, all of these measures have been enormously brutal and I, I can certainly understand uh, some of the, the logic behind it, but at the same time, it's not advancing American foreign policy. It's not making us a better country. It certainly is indicating we've got problems on the human rights level. And I, I think it's a, it's, it's a wider indication of the pathological uh, imbalance that seems to be permeating the Western world. And Tucker said, the West has gone insane. And I think that's a very, uh, very uh, accurate description, Jim. And as you know, Scott, in spite of my strong support for Donald Trump, I regard his foreign policy as seriously misguided, far yeah. too much a Zionist foreign policy, not what he or America ought to stand for. David, your thoughts? Right, Zionist, you bet. Well, first dealing with the with the foreign policy issue, which both you and Scott have touched on, um, you know, uh, you have to be um, diplomatic in the exercise of uh, foreign affairs, and I don't think that President Trump is getting sound uh, information and reasonable alternatives for solving problems. I don't think he's getting that counseling that, that he, he needs. Um, for, the, for, for the first time in, in um, his life, he's a political figure. Before this, he's viewed the world as a businessman. And now he's got a transition to being a political figure. And the leader 
of the uh, uh, United States of America. And our foreign policy traditionally has, has assisted and embraced and encouraged other nations to grow. Um, you know, the United States is about, I believe, about sharing, about loving, and about helping take care of other countries. And that's important. And we can never lose that dimension. Not like China, who released this bloody virus that, uh, that did have some effect and took some lives. I don't know what the manifestations of this are. I'm not a scientist. But, but you know, there was something there. But what it was, I have no idea. But to have it played up like, like it's been played up in the United States and to have women in Australia who are pregnant and on a beach and having them arrested by local police is, is just reprehensible to me. Think for a moment. Now, I, I saw a movie a long time ago, and I, I'm going to ask everyone to just close their eyes for a moment and just think about that woman on the beach and think about your favorite aunt, okay? Think about your mom and open your eyes. What's the difference between them being on the beach and them getting arrested? You know, this, this treatment of women like this is deplorable. Yeah. Absolutely deplorable. You know, you can extend your hand, you can talk to them, uh, you know, cautiously, carefully, discreetly, you can inform them, but to take these types of actions against women in public or in private, you know, it, it's just shocking to me. So this, this whole thing has turned into a, a, a real degradation of society across the board in country after country. And we have far too many people who are not dealing with this civilly, but they want to deal with it, uh, in my opinion, to gain economic advantage and to gain, uh, 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 you know, a, a, a step up on other other cultures and other people. You know, it's time that that the United States of America recognizes that it has a responsibility across the globe, okay, to protect freedom and democracy. And if we do that, I think we'll be fine. I think we're seeing why they had gun confiscation policies in New Zealand and Australia in anticipation of this effort, massive effort worldwide to introduce the new world order. I have no doubt that's really the agenda here. Meanwhile, Clarence Feldman, the Democrats' long temper tantrum will reelect Trump. Very interesting. It's obvious to me the deep state and Democratic Party that staffs it never got over the fact their nefarious misuse of our intelligence agencies and hoodwinking the media didn't work any better than their constant efforts after his election to remove Donald Trump from office and continue their autocratic grifting. This week was no exception. Indeed, I have to agree with Roger Simon that in the aftermath of Trump's contract in COVID-19, they are reelecting him. Any sentient viewer of this week's debate had to be disgusted. The moderator, the questions, the format all combined to make this an upscale version of the old, an old time Saturday Night Live debate. I believe for a long time, there should be a timekeeper and no moderator. The debate should be on one on national policy question with each candidate given 20 minutes to make his case and the remaining time left for rebuttal. Instead, Chris Wallace used his role to interrupt the president, prop up the failing Biden, and ask questions about white supremacy long since answered, even to him in 2016, in an effort to smear Trump. The president, First Lady Kellyanne Conway, campaign manager Bill Stevens, three White House reporters, three key Republican senators, Ron Johnson, Mike Lee, Thorne Tillis, have all tested positive. So just the slugging match about who won the non-debate debacle was lying down, the perfervent reporting and pontificating about how this happened and what it means took flight because the term case has been so misstated by a media that loves to create panic when none is called for. It's worth examining what this means. Remember, we've talked about this many times and we know that they're calling cases persons who have just fragments of old RNA and it, it's not viral, it's not contagious, they aren't sick. The only meaningful statistics show the incidence of serious illness, hospitalizations, and death 
uh, the single most important is the infection fatality rate. Co data right. collected through July 4th shows the IFR for those under age 45 is actually lower than that of the common flu. The COVID right. IFR raises for those over 50, but is hardly a death sentence. Yes, the media is dishonest in covering the health issue. It was dishonest in covering the health issues of FDR and JFK. Not unreasonably skeptical about health reports on any president, but by his appearance as he left for Wall to read his tweets, his reports of his physicians and those on the spot, the president's case is asymptomatic or mild. So the fact he has a tested positive is essentially meaningless. Right. The hyper coverage of COVID-19 has tipped a lot of hands. Nancy Pelosi is already measuring drapes for the Oval Office she hopes will be hers. The Democrats are cheering. Twitter was full of so many tweets wishing Trump would die that at no. first they would strike them and suspend the poster, then backtrack on the suspension threat, deciding just to strike the death wishing tweets. The satire site Babylon Bee noticed the party that wants to run your health care for its political opponent wants its political opponent to die. It's satire, but true. MSNBC's execrable Joy Reid suggested the president's faking it to get out of the next debate. How ridiculous yeah. is that? More class is shown by Kim Jong Un, who, according to Reuters, said he sincerely hopes that Trump recovers soon. Lots of reasons here to think the Democrats are going down big time and they're do, doing themselves great damage. Scott, your thoughts? Well, Jim, we just had another uh, indication of how big uh, media, the, the Twitter, the Facebook, uh, the, this big media companies are actually part of a propaganda ma machine because Twitter just flagged the president's tweet. He wrote out on Twitter, Flu season is coming. Many people every year, sometimes over 100,000, and despite the vaccine, die from the flu. Are we going to close down our country? No, we have learned to live with it, just like we are learning to live with COVID in most populations, far less lethal. Well, Twitter just uh, vi said uh, that violated the Twitter rules about spreading misleading and potentially harmful information related to COVID-19. However, Twitter has determined that it may be in the public interest for the tweet to remain accessible. So, you know, Twitter and Facebook, but Twitter in particular, they need to have uh, you know, law enforcement, FCC uh, agents, uh, you know, kick down the door of these uh, people and haul them out in front of Congress and have them investigated for fraud, for corruption, for violation of rights. Uh, you know, for, for this ongoing uh, Democrat propaganda campaign to make everybody fearful of a disease that was never as uh, bad as they, the predictions indicated. And mm -hmm. in fact, uh, with President Trump's uh, defeat of it and, and uh, resurrection of health, I think it sends the message to every American, uh, now is the time not just to back away from all this propaganda, but, but to stomp the life out of it. Uh, and anybody who would, who tries to uh, uh, can you know remain uh, shackled and enslave others in this uh, red tape of fear, Jim. David, your thoughts. Well, it, it's uh, uh, you mm. know, I, I, first off, I think that was very well stated, Scott. Um, I think that uh, it, this is going to be a real easy uh, manifestation headed in our direction. It's going to be Trump and Pence without a mask. And it's going to be Biden and Harris wearing masks. Now, if you want to wear masks for the next four years, make that eight years, then feel free to vote for Biden and Harris. If you want to have any chance or any reasonable effort or semblance of getting back to, to the way things were and how they are, then I think it's time to, to, to unmask. I've had enough of this masking. Flynn's had enough of the masking. The United States has had enough of this masking. You know, it's like, what was, it, what was the thing in, this, in the 60s where the women were taking their bras off all the time? I forget what the, the deal was, ban the bra? Was it ban the bra? Yeah. I sure. think it's ban the masks. Yeah. yeah. 
Yes. Ban the masks. Yes, hundred percent agreed. Excellent. It should burn be the far mask. more widespread. Yeah, burn the masks. Meanwhile, anti-lockdown protests explode globally. Massive freedom movement could destabilize a global agenda. Josh Sergerson reports on the countless anti-lockdown protests around the world getting very little news coverage, despite bringing hundreds of thousands of people to the street, mm. from clashes in Spain to clashes in London, to massive movements in Berlin, to massive movements in Toronto, Vancouver, and Winnipeg, there's clearly a shift happening toward the pro-freedom movement, despite the dire, quickly approaching brick wall that governments globally have launched humanity toward. As millions face homelessness in the U.S. alone, with millions of businesses going under while giant monopolies are propped up by the state, people are angry, and it's about time the majority of reporters out there understand why. It's time free humanity is taken seriously after nine months of tragedy. Meanwhile, powder cake, 61% say United States on verge of civil war, 52% already preparing. A majority of Americans are bracing for the possibility of a politically fired civil war, and more than half are already stockpiling food and other essential items to survive and fight back, according to a new survey shared with Secrets. In the survey, 61% said the U.S. is nearing a second civil war, and a shocking 41% strongly agree with the assessment. 52% are so convinced it's just around the corner, or after election day, they are putting away food and other essentials, an historic expansion of the prepper movement that has been brewing for years, now driven by fear and coronavirus-induced shortages. This is the single most frightening poll result I've ever been associated with, said Rich Dow, president of Engages, one of the three firms along with the sports and leisure recreation group in ROKK Solutions that conducted the Back to Normal Barometer survey. During the first presidential debate, President Trump, while agreeing to decry racially motivated groups, told the so-called Proud Boys, a militarized group that supports him, to stand back and stand by. He also repeated his concerns the Democrats are scheming to steal the election. Predictably, it's the political extremes who are most ready for war, with 52% of very liberal, 52% of very conservative, 32% of somewhat liberal, 34% of moderate, and 35% somewhat conservative, saying they believe the statement, I'm concerned the U.S. could be on the verge of another civil war. The virus is also playing a big role in the nation's anxiety. The majority of those stockpiling food and essentials are doing so because of concerns COVID-19 will spike, as many in government are predicting. We've been conducting surveys of consumers and employees since the beginning of April to help industries make strategic decisions. The current data shows an alarming trend. That extreme political polarization of the country has a majority of Americans concerned. Our country could be a powder cake ready to explode into a civil war. Scott, your thoughts? Well, I would, I would agree with that. We've been saying that for quite some time. It may be a smoldering, low-intensity conflict uh, that smokes and burns uh, for a long time. Uh, but this is what the president, of course, needs to prepare for. And he needs to, I think, give a proclamation, an executive order, a statement prior to the election that says in no uncertain terms, uh, anyone that engages in, in domestic terrorism, that uh, abuses people at restaurants, that threatens them, uh, that, that takes down statues, that uh, uh, engages in violence and arson, is guilty of domestic terrorism, according to the law, and they will be prosecuted. And there will be a 10-year prison sentence, a five-year mandatory minimum. If you engage in brutality and coercion and manipulation and terror of, civ of civilians to advance a political objective, you're no different than the Chinese Communist Party gutting the Falun Gong and Falun Dafa of their organs, cutting out and doing organ harvesting. You're no different than the... Uh, brutality of, of any fascists. Uh, and that's exactly what Antifa and Black Lives Matter are. Fascists, Black Lives Matter, founded by three lesbian black women uh, who've stated on their uh, uh, webpage that they wanted to deconstruct the nuclear family. These are the things that patriots fight and die for. They don't seem to understand that. They, 
they may try and bring a fight to conservatives, but conservatives will end it. And, uh, you know, I'm the first one to say we have no problem uh, with anyone protesting legitimately. But the moment you throw a Molotov cocktail at me or my family or my property, I'm going to shoot you right between the eyes, two in the chest, one in the head. That's the message that military police and uh, anyone who's got a gun and a patriotism is going to say, do not engage in attacks or violence against me and my property, my family, or I will defend myself with lethal force. That's going to be the developing message. The left, of course, are delusional maniacs on too much medication and uh, fed with the uh, feces of political correctness, and they have become toxic zombies. And, and personally, I think there's an entire generation of roadkill that are just absolutely worthless. And uh, it's, it's just a matter of time before they explode into this, uh, this domestic terrorist activity. But the president needs to take command of it and say ahead of time, I will put it down hard and uh, everyone who engages in violence will be, will be prosecuted as a domestic terrorist. That may win him a lot more votes too. Yeah. Uh, and he also needs to be, pre be prepared right after the election, right up to it and right after the election, of deploying the fire, uh, the, the fire trucks with the powerful uh, hoses, right? The water cannon hose trucks. He needs to be deploying those because uh, you soak these uh, punks in uh, uh, fire retardant mixed with pepper spray water and uh, ruin their clothes and ruin their day and sting their eyes. They're going to run home to their parents' basement. They're not going to come out again. These girls wearing uh, G-strings and bikini tops who are out there to get a date, not to engage in protest. They're going to run home when you soak them and ruin their days. So we need to stop playing patsy with these people and come down super hard and crush this sort of domestic terrorism and prosecute the international financiers like George Soros and others who are, who are uh, financing it and running it. Jim? David, mm -hmm. your thoughts? You know, um, Joe Biden said he is the Democratic Party. Yeah, how about that? He's the general. Uh -oh. He's the president. He's uh, he's the head. You know, this is a this is a long, deep, dark snake, and it's wiggling its way through culture in the United States of America. When when someone from Twitter makes threats about putting citizens up against a wall and shooting him as being the first in, in, you know, he has no problem doing it with a revolution. Let's reduce it to simplicity. It's, you know, it's, it's capitalism or Marxism. That's what that, you know, that, that's what that statement reveals. And if you don't understand that, you know, I, I would recommend that you pay attention in your schools and learn, learn about these things. But, you know, for, for the course of the country and the threats that face our country now, you know, the, the Democrats have an opportunity to conduct themselves civilly, to conduct themselves orderly, to quit burning, looting, and stealing, and return to civil obedience. This civil disobedience marked with violence and arson and debauchery, you know, it, it smacks of a revolution. If they're, if they're trying to start one, they're not going to be happy when people try to end it. That's right. all I have to say. Well, as I've observed on numerous occasions, there are 130 million armed Americans who aren't voting for Joe Biden and Kamala Harris. David, here, please do tell us about the suit here you have fired. This is the file. This is the first page of the suit itself. We're all fascinated to hear about it. Your thoughts? Sure. I'll take, I'll take a moment. I'll try and make a very long story short. It's very complicated, but it's also very easy. School districts rely upon uh, GO bonds, general obligation bonds, in order to build their facilities. And in the state of California, it's very simple. Before they allowed taxation up, they, they allowed uh, residences to be taxed. Then in 1978, we had Proposition 13 that said taxes have to be left at 1%. And then 
after that 1% in 1978, that limitation, they enacted uh, an amendment in, uh, I think it was 1986, that let the tax levels loosen for school districts and community colleges. They could, they could use money to not just uh, build property, they could build, they could acquire or build property, but they could also do, do things, use the bond funds for things like school buses, improving uh, apparatus at school districts, you know, like the outdoor stuff, so on and so forth. So it wasn't just the, the, the acquisition and the uh, purchase of property. In 2001, uh, Proposition 39 was enacted. And along with that came the strict accountability in, in local school bonds construction. And what that act provides is if you do things by the book, if you do things as articulated in the act, then you can use bond money for other things. You can buy furniture, you can buy equipment, you can lease property, so on and so forth. But in that act, at section 12572, it says that in your ballot measure, let me take one second here. First, there's the resolution that comes from the school board. Second, there's the full text of the measure. Third, there's the ballot question, the ballot label. On that ballot label, it has to say that the board will appoint a citizens oversight committee and will conduct annual independent audits to assure that the funds are spent only on school and classroom purposes. You have 90 seconds for the short take conclusion. Well, it's real easy, very easy. Since 2000, the ballot questions in the state of California have not included that statement. They have been issued for the past 20 years. In my opinion, they're all illegal. And I filed a lawsuit against school districts here in the County of Los Angeles. And I'm headed to the California Supreme Court next week with my petition there. We applaud you, David. Good. This is masterful. Uh, do we have time, Scott? Real brief. Well, we'll brief, the Communications Decency Act and Section 230 is what the internet company providers, Twitter and such, hide behind. But the fact is, social media did not exist in 1996 when this act was created. So they have no defense shield, and that should be immediately uh, taken up by the FCC chairman and uh, uh, the, the regulation of these, com country, uh, these companies for political meddling with messages uh, should be uh, should be in, in immediately acted upon by the White House and his administration. They have no defensive shield. The the Communications Decency, Decency Act may also be unconstitutional itself. Jim, thank you, thank you, thank you. Don, take us out. Yeah, okay, I'll do that uh, real quickly here. I'm having a fun on the computer here. Uh, can you see me? No, you can't see me. I guess. Anyway, this has been. Uh, Great show here on, on the 6th of October, News versus News. We've got all kinds of aspects going on here that we need to follow and, uh, and that we're doing the right thing, holding our government officials accountable and uh, standing up for our rights under the color of law. That's where we're at, folks. So thanks again for watching uh, Truth versus News here on October 6th. Come back next week, share this widely, and we love you. Take care. Bye-bye.